I've been with Search and Rescue for the past decade, though time seems to lose any meaning in the midst of these seemingly endless woods. We're stationed near a national park, tucked away in a remote corner where we're able to keep an eye on things. We live humble and unassuming lives, but there's a certain fulfillment in knowing our work helps keep these wild and untamed lands from utterly claiming human lives. Strange occurrences inevitably crop up in our line of work. Stories passed down like a twisted rural folklore. But there was one particular event that still leaves an icy chill snaking up my spine whenever I dare recall it. It began just like any other day, the sun lazily climbing over the horizon to chase away the lingering shadows. The radio had been a constant companion, crackling to life with reports of missing hikers or injured climbers needing our assistance. But it was the agitated voice of a young park ranger that immediately caught my attention. Something about a camping group acting strangely, performing some sort of ritual in the dead of the night. Despite the bizarre circumstances, I couldn't ignore a potential threat to the surrounding wildlife. Forgoing any mode of transportation, I decided to trek directly into the heart of the woods. The air was damp and heavy, a murky abyss cocooning the densely packed trees that defined this ancient place. I knew these woods like the back of my hand. The deep connection I always felt also meant recognizing when something was off. My instincts screamed that unnatural forces were at play, and as anyone in our line of work could attest, we were wise to heed those primal warnings. As I ventured further into the depths of the forest, the serenity swiftly evaporated. The once chirping birds fell silent, and unsettling whispers seemed to echo through the thick foliage. Even nature, itself a force both brutal and indifferent, seemed to recoil in fear from the sight I'd found. What had once been a serene clearing was now a blackened, ash-strewn pit. The charred remnants of a pyre loomed over me, a morbid totem starkly contrasting the vibrant hues of life that stubbornly clung to the periphery. My earlier suspicions began to solidify as I got closer to the ruined campsite. Disarray and broken belongings spoke volumes about the panic that had surely taken hold of my mysterious campers. In the corner of my eye, I spotted a figure darting just beyond the edge of vision. The chase had begun. Moving through the underbrush had become second nature, a dance that had me narrowly avoiding falls and obstacles with practiced ease. My quarry seemed to possess the same agility, bounding through the woods with an ethereal quality I couldn't fathom. Suddenly, their voice cut through the oppressive silence, devoid of human warmth but somehow indescribably familiar. Help me, please! Can't you see that I'm in trouble? It implored, its pleas weaving a hypnotic melancholy that threatened to drown out the instincts that now screamed warning after warning. I shook my head, forcing myself to concentrate on the footprints that were barely discernible in the damp leaves. As I gained ground, I could feel the creature's presence growing stronger, the choking tendrils of whatever unnatural force it wielded wrapping tighter around my senses. And then it changed tactics. The desperate voice became that of my own father, bellowing at me to return home, to run from this nightmare I was blindly stumbling through. My thoughts instinctively flashed back to the image of the man who'd raised me, who now lay in his final resting place far from these cursed woods. Seductive lies still whispered to me, tempting me with the one impossible thing I craved above all else. I clenched my fist, gritting my teeth through the insidious pain that wrenched my heart. You dare desecrate the memory of my father? I hissed under my breath the ferocity of my emotions only fueling my pursuit. I would not be deterred now, not when the stakes were higher than they'd ever been. The chase raged on, and the woods seemed to gnarl and thicken with malicious intent around us. Desperation hung in the air, a palpable force as both hunter and hunted knew they were teetering on the precipice of catastrophe. And then, the creature's voice again reverberated around us, though this time it was laden with a sorrowful, bereft lament. It begged for forgiveness whispered pleads for understanding of what it had done wrong, and why it couldn't return home. Its words struck a chord deep within me, a mournful resonance that echoed within the very fiber of my being. For a split second I hesitated, and it was enough. As if conjured by the very reflection of my remorse, a wall of gnarled roots erupted from the earth, sending me careening into the muddy embrace of the forest floor. Clambering back to my feet, I realized the creature had disappeared without a trace, as if it had never been there at all. In the wake of that pursuit, the forest lapsed back into an eerie calm, shadows lengthening as the golden glow of the sun began to fade into twilight. The oppressive heaviness that had been lingering around my heart seemed to dissipate with the creature's departure. 
an unsettling conclusion began to form. The uncomfortable realization that perhaps there were no true victors in this clash of worlds older than time itself. We returned to our lives, each with a newfound understanding of the other, a respectful distance maintained between hunter and hunted. My days were once again consumed by the calls of distressed hikers, my nights by the soft sigh of the wind through the trees. These woods were still my sanctuary, and as long as I drew breath, I would protect them from both the things that stalked the shadows and the darkness I felt lurking within myself. For that creature, that child of a wild and brutal force, it had marked me as much as I'd hunted it. Even now, with the sun's warmth filtering down through the canopy, I could almost hear its voice echoing through the trees. Its words, those at once hauntingly familiar and impossibly alien, were a living reminder of the delicate balance of nature that we tirelessly sought to preserve. So our lives went on, tinged with the knowledge of another existence lurking just beyond the veil. And although I sometimes allowed myself to wonder about the creature we'd battled, to question what it was, and what it had wanted from me. In the end, it was enough for me to know. The woods would always remember. It was the summer of 2009, in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, where I've spent most of my life. The park was a place of tranquility, a sanctuary from the hustle and bustle of city life. But that day, tranquility was the last thing on my mind. I was on my usual patrol route when an eerie feeling washed over me. It was as if the forest had suddenly fallen silent, the usual chorus of chirping birds and rustling leaves replaced by an unsettling stillness. I felt a chill run down my spine, a primal instinct warning me of danger. I scanned the dense foliage, my eyes drawn to a figure lurking at the edge of the clearing. It was a creature like nothing I'd ever seen before. Standing at least seven feet tall, it was covered in a thick coat of matted gray fur. Its face was distinctly canine, with a long snout and pointed ears, but its eyes were eerily human, glowing with an unnatural yellow light. It stood on two legs, its muscular body leaning against a tree, as if it were the most natural thing in the world. Our eyes locked, and for a moment, time seemed to stand still. There was a sense of malevolence in its gaze, a sinister grin that seemed to say it was fully aware of the fear it was instilling in me. I was armed with more than a BB gun, but in that moment, I felt as vulnerable as a child. The creature then bolted, disappearing into the dense undergrowth with a speed that was unnerving. I was left standing there, my heart pounding in my chest, the silence of the forest now more oppressive than ever. I didn't tell my colleagues about what I'd seen. I knew they'd dismiss it as a figment of my imagination, a result of spending too much time alone in the wilderness. But I knew what I'd seen, and I knew it wasn't the first time something strange had happened in these woods. A few weeks prior, a fellow ranger had reported hearing strange noises during his night shift. He described it as a mix of growls and snarls, like an animal in distress. He'd brushed it off as a bear or a coyote, but after my encounter, I couldn't help but wonder. I've continued my work as a park ranger, but I can't shake the feeling of being watched. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, sends my heart racing. I've started documenting my experiences, hoping to find some answers. But for now, the mystery of the Appalachian Dogman remains unsolved. It was a typical Friday evening, and I was heading home from work with a couple of my buddies, Mike and Jake. we just clocked out from our shift at the local search and rescue station, and we were all looking forward to a quiet night in. As we were making our way through the dense forest that surrounded our station, I noticed something unusual out of the corner of my eye. Across the clearing, just beyond the tree line, I saw a figure moving in the shadows. It was hard to make out in the dim light, but it was definitely larger than any animal we'd usually come across in these parts. I nudged Mike and Jake, pointing out the figure to them. They saw it too, and we all fell silent our casual conversation forgotten. Suddenly, a park ranger's SUV came barreling down the path, its emergency lights flashing in the twilight. The vehicle skidded to a halt near the figure, and two rangers jumped out, their flashlights cutting through the darkness. The beams landed on the figure, and it turned to face them. The sight that met our eyes was something straight out of a horror movie. The figure was tall, easily over six feet, and it was covered in a dark, almost black fur. Its eyes glowed a sinister red in the flashlight beams, but that could have just been the reflection. Before we could even process what we were seeing, 
Another vehicle pulled up on the same side of the clearing as the figure. Its headlights illuminated the creature fully, and I heard Jake mutter a quiet prayer under his breath. The creature unfurled what looked like a pair of massive wings, and with a powerful leap, it took to the air. As it soared over the stunned rangers, it let out a chilling screech that echoed through the forest, sounding eerily similar to the squeal of train brakes. It circled the clearing twice, its screech piercing the silence, before flying off towards the distant mountains. Just as we were trying to make sense of what we'd just witnessed, a white pickup truck with the park's emblem pulled up next to us. The ranger inside told us to clear out immediately. We didn't need to be told twice. As we hurriedly made our way back to our car, we saw several more vehicles, both marked and unmarked, pull up to the scene. The drive home was filled with stunned silence. We all tried to wrap our heads around what we'd seen. Later that night, Jake, who worked the night shift at the station, told me that the park rangers had been patrolling the area for hours, asking anyone they came across to stay indoors for their safety. I spent the rest of the night researching similar sightings online, and that's how I came across your podcast. I knew I had to reach out and share our story. As a search and rescue officer, I've seen and experienced many strange things over the years. Most were easily explainable or simply the product of my imagination after a long day spent traversing the treacherous terrain of the national park where I work. A picturesque but unforgiving place that had inexplicably, time and time again, managed to draw the unwary into its clutches. Despite all that I've seen, there remains one particular event that, to this day, sends shivers running down my spine. It began with the disappearance of a young family of four, the Johnsons. They had embarked on what should have been a harmless weekend camping trip in one of the park's more remote and less frequented sectors. Having handled countless missing person cases over the years, I was unnervingly familiar with the all-too-well-trodden path that leads from serene family vacation to tearful pleas for aid. I assembled the search and rescue team, gathered our equipment, and began the systematic process of scouring the wooded expanse for any sign of the Johnsons. As our search progressed, it became evident that something was amiss. We encountered no torn clothing or strewn belongings to suggest any violent struggle or attack. Instead, we found eerily perfect footprints, indicating a calm, unhurried pace that seemed to have no discernible starting or ending point. What was even stranger was that these sibilant tracks only appeared around the increasingly frequent sites of bizarre and unexplained occurrences. As we moved along, we kept stumbling upon small, inexplicable holes arranged in perfectly symmetrical patterns, torturous labyrinths of stacked stones, and the solitary howls of what we could only assume to be wolves, even though they hadn't been spotted in this part of the park for decades. In spite of the unnerving circumstances, we pressed on undeterred. After all, a family's lives hung in the balance, and their only hope for rescue rested upon our shoulders. The atmosphere was thick with a palpable sense of unease, yet my team continued their diligent search for the missing family, combing through the dense foliage and traversing the rugged landscape until long after the sun had set and the inky blackness of night took hold. Our base camp was situated at the edge of a generous clearing, a large campfire emitting a warm amber glow served as our much-needed beacon of comfort in a forest that seemed increasingly hostile to our presence. As my team settled in and made preparations to retire for the night, one of my colleagues suggested that we each take turns keeping watch, just in case any clues, or God forbid any actual threats, made themselves apparent during the witching hour. It was during the third watch, just as the embers of the fire were barely clinging to life, that I was roused from a fitful slumber by the faintest of whispers. Are they gone? It asked, its voice barely audible above the rustling leaves and the sibilant hiss of the dying fire. I completely still, my heart pounding wildly against my ribcage as I struggled to decipher whether this utterance was just some figment of my own sleepy imagination or some otherworldly being that had somehow infiltrated our encampment. As the seconds ticked by and the whispering continued, urgent as it was ethereal, it became apparent that there was some sentient force at play here. I could feel the presence of this strange entity, its existence hovering in the cold air just out of sight, yet always nearby, as though to assert dominance over its unwanted guests. As if sensing my own teetering sense of composure, the voice seemed to retreat for a moment only to return with a vengeance, sounding louder and more sinister than before, still asking insistently, Are they gone? The ones who took them? 
I had no rational answer to give, yet as the realization hit me that the voice was actually searching for the same family we were, my heart went out to this lost, disembodied soul. They must be found. They must be stopped. It continued to mutter, growing increasingly desperate as the hours wore on. Somehow, compelled by a mixture of terror and intrigue, I opted to remain silent and observant throughout the ordeal, hoping that this bizarre entity would relinquish some useful information, or at least leave us be. Much to my relief, the whispers eventually receded, and it wasn't until the sun's rays peeked over the horizon that their haunting presence finally dissipated entirely. Exhausted but resolute, I wasted no time in sharing my nocturnal experience with the rest of the team. Although lacking definitive answers, we couldn't leave any lead, no matter how absurd it may seem, unchaste. Agreeing that at the very least, there might be some unknown predator or ominous force at work, we pressed onward with even greater determination to locate the Johnsons before any further harm could befall them. Our search took us deeper and deeper into the forest, and as we followed the enigmatic footprints, we began to notice that they were gradually becoming more erratic. Whereas these tracks had previously exhibited an unnerving calm and focus, they now seemed to be plagued by panic and haste. As the trail led us further into the increasingly dense foliage of the park, the shift in footprints also bore witness to a shift in the strange occurrences that we encountered. The howls grew louder and pierced through the air with a newfound ferocity. The haunting messages scrawled into the tree trunks began to take on a more urgent and ominous quality, and that persistent, ever-present voice returned, now sounding more determined and focused than ever. I found them, it whispered, triumphant. Thinking back, it was hearing those words that finally spurred me to confront this otherworldly presence directly. Perhaps whatever force had manifested itself within the forest was, in some dark and twisted way, guiding us towards the Johnsons after all. Where? I dared to whisper back, my voice trembling with the full weight of my fear. Suddenly the ghostly voice retreated, leaving in its stead an opaque patch of mist hovering mere inches from my face, beguiling to look at and yet chilling to the core. As my team stood behind me, each one equally startled and unsure of what we were facing, a plume of air shot through the mist, and the voice surged forth once more. Follow, it commanded, the whisper turning into a guttural growl that seemed to echo from every direction. With no other choice, and an ever-growing fear in our hearts, we complied, pushing further into the dense, unforgiving forest. The howling grew in volume and intensity as we trudged onwards. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and my eyes darted from one shadowy figure to the next, half expecting to see some monstrous creature lunge at us from the dense brush. Instead we stumbled upon a clearing, at the center of which lay the Johnson's abandoned and eerily untouched campsite. The lingering sense of unease was palpable, and as we approached, it became evident that the family had simply vanished without a trace. The tent stood undisturbed, as if only recently vacated. The fire pit was cold, the remains of a meal still resting on the picnic table. At the sight of the campsite, the voice's tone shifted once more, descending into a low, mournful whisper. They were here, but now they're gone. I failed them. Our team worked quickly and meticulously to scour every inch of the area for any clue that might aid us in the family's rescue. As we searched, the howling intensified, and the once distant wolves now seemed to surround us, their eerie, guttural cries echoing throughout the clearing. The whispering voice, still present yet somehow distant amidst the cacophony, murmured its own frustrations. They're close. I can feel it. Yet they elude me still. Having exhausted all our available avenues, we made the difficult decision to return to base camp and regroup. We trudged back through the oppressive forest, trailed by the ever-present howls and the spectral voice's mournful lamentations. And that's where our search took a sinister turn. As if sensing our fragile state of hopelessness, the voice began to taunt us coyly, insinuating that the Johnsons were not as innocent as we believed. At one point, it coldly informed me that the family had desecrated sacred ground, setting off a chain reaction of supernatural events that now held them firmly in its grasp. I don't know whether it was a twisted deception or a cruel truth, but the revelation sent a chill straight through me. Regardless of their guilt or innocence, though, the Johnsons were in grave danger, of that much. I was certain. Despite our best efforts, we were unable to locate any trace of the missing family. As the days wore on, the strange occurrences intensified, 
culminating in the agonizing realization that we were no longer merely searching for the lost campers. Instead, we found ourselves ensnared in a malevolent force's elaborate game. Soon, we conceded defeat and retreated from the haunted forest. The all-too-familiar weight of failure burdened our hearts as we left the wilderness, grappling with the terror we had experienced and the eerie voice that had haunted our steps. Some weeks later, a group of hikers stumbled upon the Johnson's remains deep within the forest, reduced to little more than gnawed bones and tattered shreds of clothing. It seemed, then, that our spectral guide had been deceiving us all along, leading us away from their bodies and confusing our investigations with falsehoods and other sense-defying phenomena. To this day, I am haunted by the loss of those innocent lives. The chilling whispers of the disembodied voice worm their way into my dreams, serving as a perpetual reminder of the dangers that lurk within the forest, and how starkly outmatched I was against the supernatural evil that claimed the Johnsons. In the many years that have since passed, the voice remains a mystery, its ultimate motivations and desires shrouded in enigma. While it's true that my colleagues and I have since helped to save countless lives, rescuing many from the myriad dangers that lurk within the majestic yet unforgiving National Park, the case of the Johnson family and the strange, haunting entity that ensnared us all will forever dwell in the darkest recesses of my memory. It was a frigid night in January of this year, the kind of cold that seeps into your bones and makes you question why you chose a career in the great outdoors. I was on my usual patrol route through the dense woods of the Hocking Hills State Park, Ohio. As a park ranger, I've seen my fair share of wildlife, but nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to encounter. The night was as dark as coal, the only light coming from the dim glow of my truck's headlights and the occasional flicker of the stars peeking through the dense canopy of trees. I was driving along O374, a road I've traveled countless times before, when something caught my eye near the old man's cave area. At first I thought it was a deer, its silhouette illuminated by the faint glow of my headlights, but as I slowed down, I realized this was no ordinary creature. Its body was a grotesque mix of human and animal, its skin pale and hairless, save for a patch of matted black fur on its back. Its legs were twisted and bent at unnatural angles, dragging along the ground as it moved. But what truly sent chills down my spine were its antlers. They were long and thick, jutting out from its skull in a chaotic array of points, unlike any deer I've ever seen. I stopped the truck, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature seemed to sense my presence, its head snapping towards me. Its eyes, oh those eyes, they were a haunting shade of white, devoid of any life, yet filled with an eerie intelligence. It was then that I realized, this was no ordinary creature. This was something out of a nightmare, something that belonged in the realm of folklore and legends. A wendigo, as the locals would call it. I've heard stories of strange happenings in these woods, whispers of creatures that defy explanation, but I've always dismissed them as mere tales spun by the locals to scare off tourists. But now, faced with the undeniable reality of what I was seeing, I couldn't help but question everything I thought I knew. I wanted to reach for my camera, to capture proof of this chilling encounter. But fear had its icy grip on me, and all I could do was sit there, frozen in my seat, as the creature slowly disappeared into the darkness. I drove home that night at a speed I'd never dared before, the image of the creature forever etched in my mind. Ever since that night, I've been plagued with questions. What was that creature? Why was it here? Are there more of them? I've taken it upon myself to find answers, to delve deeper into the mysteries of these woods. But for now, I wait, my eyes ever watchful, for the next encounter with the unknown. It was the summer of 1997, six years after my first encounter with a skinwalker, when I had my second run-in. I was in my early teens then, and we were visiting my uncle's ranch in New Mexico. He was the same uncle whose friend had saved me from the skinwalker back in Texas. I had heard stories about strange happenings around his ranch, but I had never experienced anything firsthand. That was about to change. The ranch was a sprawling property, surrounded by miles of desert and dotted with patches of woodland. My uncle had a few horses and a small herd of cattle. He also had a problem with coyotes, or so he thought. I knew better. I knew what lurked in the shadows what hid behind the guise of a coyote. 
One evening I was out exploring the property, something I often did to kill time. The sun was setting, casting long shadows that danced and flickered with the wind. I was near the edge of a small woodland when I heard it, a soft, whimpering cry. It sounded like a wounded animal, but there was something off about it. It was too... human. I felt a chill run down my spine. I knew what it was. I had heard it before. It was a skinwalker. I should have run, but curiosity got the better of me. I crept closer, my heart pounding in my chest. I could hear my own blood rushing in my ears. Suddenly a figure emerged from the shadows. It was a coyote, or at least it looked like one. But its eyes... Its eyes were human. They were filled with a malevolent intelligence that no animal should possess. It was staring right at me, its gaze piercing my very soul. I froze, my breath hitching in my throat. I could see the creature's muscles ripple under its fur as it took a step towards me. I could see the gleam of its teeth as it bared them in a grotesque imitation of a smile. I could see the raw, primal hunger in its eyes. Then, it spoke. Its voice was a guttural growl, but the words were unmistakably human. Help me? It rasped, its voice echoing in the stillness of the evening. It was mimicking a human in distress, trying to lure me in. But I wasn't a scared six-year-old anymore. I knew what it was, and I knew what it wanted. I took a step back, my hand instinctively reaching for the knife I always carried with me. The creature's smile widened, its eyes gleaming with anticipation. That's when I heard the gunshot. The creature yelped and darted back into the shadows. I turned to see my uncle, rifle in hand, standing a few feet away. He had a grim look on his face as he lowered the gun. I thought I told you to stay away from the woods, he said, his voice gruff. I nodded, unable to speak. I knew then that my uncle was aware of the skinwalkers. He knew what lurked in the shadows of his ranch. And like me, he was prepared to face it. Since then, I've had more encounters with skinwalkers, each one more terrifying than the last. But I'm not scared. I'm ready. I know what's out there, and I'm prepared to face it. I've dedicated my life to hunting these creatures, to protecting others from the horrors I've experienced. And I won't stop until every last one of them is dead. But I know it's a long road ahead. These creatures are cunning, elusive. They're not like any other predator I've encountered. They're smarter, more dangerous. They know how to hide, how to blend in. They know how to lure you in, how to make you let your guard down. And that's when they strike. I've seen it happen too many times. I've seen them take the form of a loved one, a friend, a helpless animal. I've seen them use their voices to mimic human speech, to cry for help, to beg for mercy. But it's all a ruse, a trap to lure you in. And once you're in their grasp, there's no escape. But I won't let that happen. I won't let them hurt anyone else. I've devoted my life to this cause, to hunting these creatures down. I've trained, I've studied, I've prepared. I know their tricks, their tactics. I know how to spot them, how to track them, how to kill them. And I won't stop until I've rid the world of these monsters. Until I've ensured that no one else has to go through what I've been through. Until I've made the world a safer place. But I know I can't do it alone. I need help. I need others who are willing to stand with me, to fight with me. Others who have seen what I've seen, who know what I know. Others who are ready to take up the mantle, to join the hunt. So I'm reaching out, sharing my story, spreading the word. I'm looking for others like me, others who are ready to stand against the darkness. Because I know I can't do it alone. But together, we can make a difference. Together we can fight back. Together we can win. But for now, I continue my hunt. I continue my search for these creatures, these skinwalkers. I continue to train, to prepare, to stay vigilant. Because I know they're out there, waiting, watching. And I'm always ready for my next encounter. Ever since I was a young boy, I had heard the whispers of the darker side of the wilderness. Tales of things lurking in the shadows, unfathomable and perilous, had always been shared in hushed and fearful voices. My grandpa had been a ranger way back, and he would spin us yarns of the things he'd seen and heard during his time on the force. It fueled my dreams and gave me shivers, all at the same time. 
I knew one day I'd follow in his footsteps, seeking to quench my own curiosity while protecting the people who ventured into the wild. By the time I enlisted as a search and rescue officer in a national park, I had steeled myself against the fear that had once held me captive. Armed with determination, training, and my trusty canine companion Riku, I believed there was nothing the forest could throw at me that I couldn't handle. Well, as they say, belief is a fragile thing. It happened while we were investigating a report of two missing boys in the western part of the park. The previous night's weather had been unforgiving, and the entire operation had proven difficult. The rain had made the trail slick and muddy, and even with Riku's keen sense of smell, it was no easy task to find the boys. After a long day of following faint tracks and picking up discarded wrappers or clothes, we finally stumbled upon a cave hidden beneath a thick canopy of trees. The boys were huddled together near the entrance, cold and wet, but alive. Riku's excited howls and wagging tail were all the proof I needed. There was a reason I considered him a member of my family. While the boys shivered and thanked us for the timely rescue, it was impossible to ignore the subtle anxiousness in their eyes. They shared hesitant glances, and I pressed them for information about their expedition, trying to figure out what had happened to them that sent them into the wilderness in the first place. Their story was one of terror and confusion. They had set out for a daring camping adventure, not bothering to inform their parents of their plans. They had experienced the usual trials any amateur camper would, battling mosquitoes, keeping their fire alight, and listening to the howls of distant wolves or coyotes. But what sent chills down my spine was the recount of a figure they had seen through the swirling mist, tall and imposing. They swore it had glowing eyes, like living embers, and that it had watched them from a distance before lurching back into the shadows with a horrendous guttural howl. It wasn't the first time I'd encountered stories like this, unimaginable things in the wilderness, but somehow it felt much closer to home this time. The fear in their eyes was real, and I knew deep down that there was something else in that forest. We transported the boys safely back to base, but that spark of fear and curiosity ignited by their story refused to be extinguished. I began to dig deeper, talking to colleagues and locals about shadowy figures and hidden monsters. They all seemed to have their own variations of the tale, yet the details always eerily resembled what the boys had recounted. I think it's fair to say I became obsessed. Sleep became elusive, my waking hours consumed by thoughts of the unknown. Slowly, that burning passion to unravel the unseen began to consume me, pushing me further into the forest and away from my familiar surroundings. For weeks, Riku and I delved deep into the recesses of the park, following trails and whispers, always haunted by the sensation of something lurking just outside my vision. It was when we stumbled upon an area that seemed almost untouched that I felt the same uneasiness the boys had described. The air grew colder, heavy with the scent of damp earth and something different. It was simultaneously alluring and revolting, a potent blend of rot, death, and unexplained familiarity. Riku whimpered, his eyes searching the encroaching shadows, and I knew without a doubt that whatever I was seeking was close. We continued cautiously, prepared for the worst yet unsure of what that might entail. As the shadows of twilight began to creep across the land, I heard it, the howl I'd been dreading, tearing through the hush of the forest. It was like the tortured cry of a wounded animal, mixed with the rage of an enraged predator. Instinctively and against my better judgment, I pressed forward guided by some unknown force that was both beckoning and terrifying. The horror that awaited us was beyond anything I could have possibly imagined. There, amidst the detritus of the ancient trees, stood the figure I'd been seeking. It towered over me, a twisted mass of fur, mangled limbs, and pure malice. Its glowing eyes seemed to peer into the depths of my soul, forever trapping me in a state of terror. Driven by a desperate desire to survive, I raised my service weapon and fired into the shadows, barely noticing Riku's barks mixed with the deafening gunshots. The beast stumbled but did not fall, instead enraged and undeterred. I barely remember the following moments, a blur of terror and adrenaline. Escaping through the forest with Riku at my heels, we left the haunting visage of the creature far behind, retreating into the security of civilized lands. I never did return to search and rescue forever changed by the nightmare lurking in the depths of the park. My grandpa's stories no longer held any allure, replaced instead with a lifelong desire to distance myself from the monstrous reality that I encountered. 
To this day, I don't know what I saw, nor do I want to. I've come to respect the ancient secrets the forest holds, the forgotten terrors that walk its hallowed grounds, and the warning it gave me to never venture into its darkness again. Heed my warning and keep your loved ones close. Sometimes, the bite of reality is far worse than the flickers of legend, and what once was a story now lives within me, a burden I'll carry for the rest of my days, the memory of the shadow I met in the untamed wild. Growing up in the shadow of the Blue Ridge Mountains in western Virginia, Lori's childhood had been filled with outdoor escapades. The mountains had the uniquely charming ability to frustrate her with their unpredictability, yet enchant her with their untamed beauty. Just as she had her fair share of idyllic moments from her daytime adventures, she also had her share of eerie encounters. These were usually supplanted by the nocturnal kind, but there was one experience that had occurred long before sundown which haunted Lori to her very core. Yet in retrospect, she was thankful for these moments since they reinforced her respect for the vast terrain she now patrolled. Today, as a search and rescue ranger in the Shenandoah National Park, Lori was tasked with the responsibility of keeping hikers safe, novice and experienced alike. Though she encountered many wildlife species, rumor had it there was another creature lurking about that she only heard through the grapevines, the moon crows of the Appalachian. Lori had heard stories of these massive birds, stretching wingspans up to ten feet, said to have descended from the ancient volcano-dwelling birds of lore. In a land where uncharted caves and secret conduits abound, Lori knew better than to fully dismiss the possibility of these fabled birds. It was during one of her routine sweeps that Lori received word of a hiker lost in a remote area of the park. The area was so remote and treacherous that visitors were practically forbidden from venturing too deep. Lori soon found herself driving toward this precarious area, her pickup traversing a rocky pathway, winding through the Appalachian wilderness. With each passing mile, she grew tense. Veterans of the park would often warn their juniors to avoid the place. What was this hiker doing here? When Lori arrived on the scene, two of her fellow rangers were waiting for her. Jim, an experienced ranger, and Emily, a fellow newcomer, briefed Lori quickly. The hiker's tracks had led them to the very heart of the region, the fabled nesting ground of the infamous moon crows. Lori listened with both fascination and dread. The hiker's family had told them that he was a bird enthusiast, possibly seeking out the stories he had heard of the mythical moon crows. The trio tracked the hiker further into the wilderness, their only guide the fading footprints left on the forest floor. The silence of their surroundings was unnerving, an unsettling quietness that felt eerily unnatural. Lori could sense the birds watching them from above, hidden behind a shroud of mist and canopies of green. It was near twilight when they finally found the hiker, rattled and frightened, but alive. When Lori spoke to him, his speech was fragmented, filled with fear and awe. He claimed to have seen the elusive moon crows, their beaks like daggers, black as the cavernous voids they lived in. His voice trembled as he described the feeling of seeing a glimpse of something that was never meant to be discovered. As they led the hiker back to their pickup, Lori studied her surroundings, the feeling of being watched lingering in the back of her mind. Uneased, she imagined the massive wings of the moon crows casting haunting shadows on the forest floor. She felt the weight of Jim and Emily's silence, the hiker's words anchoring their search party into a world of the unknown. It wasn't the first unsettling tale she had heard while patrolling the park, and Lori knew it wouldn't be the last. The stories from her past rang in her head like warnings, reinforcing the respect she held for the wilderness and its secrets. The world of man and beast were never meant to truly meet, and there was a surreal kind of solace in the fact that there remained a terrain uncharted by even the most ambitious search and rescue ranger. About a month later, Lori found herself wandering the same remote region of the park during a search and rescue mission, weaving her way through the dense foliage that seemed to be holding its breath in anticipation. It had been a little over a month since their encounter with the moon crows, and though she hadn't seen them herself, the hiker's chilling account remained engraved in her memory. However, today's mission pulled her thoughts back to the present moment. The team had received a distress call from a group of campers who had lost track of one of their friends during a hike. The chilling coincidence of the location didn't escape Lori's notice, and she couldn't shake the feeling that they were once again being observed from above. The rest of her team felt it too. 
exchanging glances of unease with every rustling branch or snapping twig. As the search party ventured deeper into the heart of the Moon Crow's territory, they spoke in hushed whispers, careful not to disturb the mysteries that lay hidden in the shadows. Emily, clenching a map with white-knuckled determination, took the lead as they followed the frantic tracks left behind by the missing camper. The sun dipped lower in the sky, painting the forest with a palette of oranges and reds, as they continued their journey. It was under the canopy of twilight that they found the camper, her face pale with fear against the backdrop of fading light. She relayed her harrowing experience, speaking of enormous birds with piercing eyes and beaks like black blades. She described how the creatures seemed to dance between reality and legend, a ghostly presence guarding their kingdom. It was then Lori realized that the Moon Crows were not just ancient lore or whispered fables, but protectors of a world that bowed only to its own natural forces. They were a force of nature, reminding her of her place at the mercy of the wilderness she called home. As the search party escorted the shaken camper back to her campsite, Lori reflected on the thin line separating curiosity from respect, the humility and understanding that some things were never meant to be fully explained or discovered. Though Lori couldn't shake a craving for answers, each encounter like this embedded a deeper reverence in her heart, for both the wilderness that challenged her and the secrets that chased her. It was late in the evening when my father and I were returning from a weekend camping trip. We were driving down an old rural road that snaked around the dense, silent woods. As the sun started to descend towards the horizon, the shadows of the ancient trees stretched across the asphalt like skeletal fingers. Our car, an old and worn-out station wagon, was crammed with all our camping gear and the few souvenirs we gathered during our trip. The smell of the damp forest air and the soft humming of the car's engine enveloped us, creating a somber atmosphere. As we rounded a bend, my father broke the silence. He mentioned that he had heard stories from his grandfather about strange creatures lurking in the deep corners of these woods, particularly on moonless nights. The tales never bothered him as a child, but as the darkness encroached, I couldn't help but feel uneasy. A few more minutes had passed when suddenly, our car's headlights illuminated a pale, lanky figure up ahead. At first I thought it was just a trick of the light, or my imagination taking hold of me but my dad's sharp intake of breath confirmed he saw it too. The figure moved quickly, disappearing behind the tall trees before we could get a closer look. Its unsettling, abnormal gait and skeletal form left us feeling apprehensive. We exchanged worried glances as the car continued down the road, unsure if we should turn back or keep moving forward. As we drove on, I noticed that the once vibrant wildlife had become eerily quiet. It felt as if the forest was holding its breath, watching our every move. We tried to shake our fears and focus on our journey home, but the nagging sensation of being monitored stayed with us. The further we traveled, the more we saw signs of the pale figure's haunting presence, flattened dead foliage near the roadside, and an uncomfortable, lingering chill in the air. It became clear that whatever it was that we had seen, it had left an unmistakable mark on the woods around us. Eventually, we reached the edge of the forest where the road opened up into the familiar suburban streets near our home. Relief washed over us as the normalcy of the streetlights and neatly lined houses filled our sights. We breathed a sigh of unified relief, but could not shake the chilling memory of the creature we'd encountered. Now, each night when I lay my head down to sleep, I can't help but listen for the creaking of ancient trees and the rustling of leaves. The unsettling memories of that evening and my father's stories swirl in my mind, leaving me to ponder the wild, unexplained creatures that might be concealed in the darkness of the forest. Despite our disturbing encounter, life went on as usual. The incident faded into memory, becoming just another tale to share around the campfire. My father and I rarely spoke of it, finding comfort in the mundane routine of our daily lives, but we couldn't deny the persistent curiosity that gnawed at our minds. Months passed and the changing seasons brought the crisp, cool air of autumn. It was around this time that the local community began to notice peculiar happenings around the woods. Pets went missing, and once thriving wildlife seemed to have vanished, leaving the forest eerily quiet. Talk of a strange creature lurking in the shadows took hold of the town, and whispers of its pale, menacing appearance conjured unease among the residents, especially in my father and me. 
We couldn't shake the feeling that what we had seen that night was more than just a fleeting encounter with an unknown creature. As the days grew shorter, I decided to investigate on my own. Late one evening, I ventured into the forest, camera in hand, hoping to document any unusual occurrences or evidence of the creature. It quickly became apparent that something was wrong, as the forest felt hollow and lifeless. As the darkness descended, I stumbled upon an old, hidden clearing near the heart of the woods. Tall trees loomed over the area, making it feel strangely confined. The ground was scattered with animal remains and strangely shaped footprints, unlike anything I had ever seen before. My heart raced as I finally found photographic evidence of the creature's presence. I returned home, eager to show my father the proof. We decided it was time to share our experiences with the community, bringing attention to the sinister presence in our woods. Our small town organized a search party to comb the area, hoping to find answers, or at the very least, scare away the malevolent being. The search went on for days, but there was no trace to be found of the creature or the sinister energy it brought. As the weeks passed, the forest seemingly returned to normal. Wildlife began to emerge from their hideaways, and a sense of normalcy returned to the community. Many years ago, when I was still new to my job as a search and rescue worker, my team and I were assigned to patrol a large national park within the vicinity of our base. Our main responsibilities included ensuring the safety of visitors, maintaining trails, and responding to any emergencies within the park. During our daily patrols, we would often come across hikers who shared stories and experiences they had while exploring the park. Most of these tales were the usual accounts of sightings of beautiful wildlife, or anecdotes of close encounters with less than friendly animals. However, there was one particular story that stuck with me throughout the years. It was one late afternoon shift when my colleagues and I were making our way back to our station. We came across a group of frightened hikers, huddled together near the edge of the trail. They were visibly shaken, and in their eyes, we could see genuine terror. As we brought them back to the safety of our station, they began to recount their experience. According to their story, they had come across a strange, terrifying creature while hiking deep within the forest. It was a large, hairy figure, unlike anything they had ever seen before. It walked on two legs and had a sinister aura that emitted fear and unease. The creature seemed to be observing them from a distance, as if it was studying their behavior. Despite being visibly shaken, the hikers insisted that they were indeed telling the truth, and in their voices, there was an unwavering conviction about what they had encountered. My colleagues and I exchanged glances, unsure of what to make of their story. While the park was known for its wildlife, there had never been any records or reports of such a creature. We filed a report of the incident and forwarded it to our superiors, but we never received any updates or follow-ups about it. The event eventually faded from our minds, and we continued to carry out our duties in the park without giving it much thought. Several years later, while discussing old cases with some of my more experienced colleagues, the story of the mysterious creature resurfaced. Without prompting, one of my colleagues shared a similar story from his earlier years as a search and rescue worker. He spoke about a seasoned park ranger who had encountered something unexplainable during a solo patrol. This ranger, a highly respected and experienced professional, had suddenly abandoned his post and cut off all ties with the park service. When my colleague told this story, the similarities to the hiker's account were uncanny. Both described a large, hulking creature walking on two legs, with an air of danger surrounding it. The terrifying aura of this creature seemed to have a lasting effect on those who had encountered it, forever imprinting itself on their minds. Although these stories remained as unofficial campfire tales among the search and rescue community, they always served as a reminder to me of the vast, unknown nature of the areas we were responsible for. Even in our modern age of satellite imagery and advanced technology, there remained corners of our country where the unknown still hid. This stark realization always made me more cautious and vigilant during my patrols, making certain to respect the mysterious wilderness in which we worked. Stationed in the heart of British Columbia, I've seen my fair share of wildlife, weathered storms, and navigated treacherous terrains. But there's one summer night in 2023 that stands out from the rest. A night that still sends shivers down my spine when I recall it. It was a typical evening. The sun had set, 
and the forest was alive with the nocturnal symphony of crickets and distant howls. I was stationed at a remote outpost, a few kilometers from the nearest highway. The outpost was a simple wooden cabin, nestled among towering pines and overlooked by the majestic Rockies. It was a place of solitude, a place where I could connect with nature, away from the hustle and bustle of the city. That night I was sitting on the porch, sipping my coffee, when I heard a rustling in the underbrush. I initially dismissed it as a deer or a raccoon, common visitors to the outpost. But then, the rustling grew louder, more persistent. It was as if something large was moving through the forest, something that didn't care about being heard. I grabbed my flashlight and ventured into the darkness, my heart pounding in my chest. The rustling stopped as I approached, replaced by an eerie silence. I scanned the area with my flashlight, the beam cutting through the darkness, revealing nothing out of the ordinary. But then, I heard a low growl, a sound that was neither human nor animal, a sound that sent a chill down my spine. Before I could react, a large object hurtled towards me from the darkness, crashing into the ground just a few feet away. I jumped back, my heart racing. It was a log, a massive one, easily eight feet long and a foot in diameter. It was as if it had been thrown with incredible force. But by what? I shone my flashlight in the direction the log had come from, but there was nothing there, just the dense forest. But then, I heard it again, the low growl, closer this time. I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I was not alone. I retreated to the cabin, my mind racing. I had heard stories of strange occurrences in these woods, of hikers going missing, of strange noises in the night but I had always dismissed them as folklore, stories to scare the tourists. But now, I wasn't so sure. I spent the rest of the night in the cabin, my eyes glued to the window, my hand clutching my service revolver. The growls eventually subsided, replaced by the familiar sounds of the forest. But the sense of unease remained, a reminder of the unknown that lurked in the darkness. In the morning, I ventured out to inspect the log. It was indeed massive, far too heavy for a human to lift, let alone throw. I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was watching me, something that didn't want me there. I reported the incident to my superiors, but they dismissed it as a bear or a prank. But I know what I saw, what I heard. There's something out there, in the wilderness of British Columbia, something that we don't understand. Since that night, I've heard similar stories from other rangers, stories of strange occurrences, of unexplained phenomena. I've started documenting these incidents, hoping to find some answers. But for now, the mystery remains, a chilling reminder of the unknown that lurks in the wilderness. Many years ago, when I was still new to my job as a search and rescue worker, my team and I were assigned to patrol a large national park within the vicinity of our base. Our main responsibilities included ensuring the safety of visitors, maintaining trails, and responding to any emergencies within the park. During our daily patrols, we would often come across hikers who shared stories and experiences they had while exploring the park. Most of these tales were the usual accounts of sightings of beautiful wildlife or anecdotes of close encounters with less than friendly animals. However, there was one particular story that stuck with me throughout the years. It was one late afternoon shift when my colleagues and I were making our way back to our station we came across a group of frightened hikers, huddled together near the edge of the trail. They were visibly shaken, and in their eyes, we could see genuine terror. As we brought them back to the safety of our station, they began to recount their experience. According to their story, they had come across a strange, terrifying creature while hiking deep within the forest. It was a large, hairy figure, unlike anything they had ever seen before. It walked on two legs and had a sinister aura that emitted fear and unease. The creature seemed to be observing them from a distance, as if it was studying their behavior. Despite being visibly shaken, the hikers insisted that they were indeed telling the truth, and in their voices, there was an unwavering conviction about what they had encountered. My colleagues and I exchanged glances, unsure of what to make of their story. While the park was known for its wildlife, there had never been any records or reports of such a creature. We filed a report of the incident and forwarded it to our superiors, but we never received any updates or follow-ups about it. The event eventually faded from our minds, and we continued to carry out our duties in the park without giving it much thought. 
Several years later, while discussing old cases with some of my more experienced colleagues, the story of the mysterious creature resurfaced. Without prompting, one of my colleagues shared a similar story from his earlier years as a search and rescue worker. He spoke about a seasoned park ranger who had encountered something unexplainable during a solo patrol. This ranger, a highly respected and experienced professional, had suddenly abandoned his post and cut off all ties with the park service. When my colleague told this story, the similarities to the hiker's account were uncanny. Both described a large, hulking creature walking on two legs, with an air of danger surrounding it. The terrifying aura of this creature seemed to have a lasting effect on those who had encountered it, forever imprinting itself on their minds. Although these stories remained as unofficial campfire tales among the search and rescue community, they always served as a reminder to me of the vast, unknown nature of the areas we were responsible for. Even in our modern age of satellite imagery and advanced technology, there remained corners of our country where the unknown still hid. This stark realization always made me more cautious and vigilant during my patrols, making certain to respect the mysterious wilderness in which we worked.